so what did we do last week? We were showing that the UMD property implied boundedness of the Hilbert transform, and we showed that it implies boundedness of various Fourier multipliers, your, your Michelin multipliers. So we've shown that the UMD property implies a bunch of stuff in Fourier analysis that's useful in applications, that's useful and interesting in its own right. But we still need to show that the UMD property is actually necessary for these things. It could be that we're asking for some strong property, which is actually stronger than necessary. Like maybe these things actually work for all Banach spaces. This is not true. The UMD property is absolutely necessary and we will prove that this week. So to the whole point of today, at least, is well, okay, the point of this week is to show that the Hilbert transform boundedness implies the UMD property, quite simply put. But the thing is, if you want to prove the UMD property, you have to show some unconditionality property for all Martin curls. That's what the UMD property is. And to make our life a bit easier, we'd like to not have to prove that for every single Martin girl. That's maybe a bit too much work. We want to make the job easier for us. So we're going to introduce something called dyadic UMD, which is weaker, or at least which seems weaker than UMD, so that we can show that boundedness of the Hilbert transform actually, well, sorry, my screen is going a bit crazy. So that we can show boundedness of the Hilbert transform implies this weaker dyadic UMD property, which involves less Martin Gales. And then we'll just show, okay, that's actually equivalent to the UMD property anyway. Basically, we want to make our life easier. So we need to do a bit of preliminary setup to reduce to an easier problem. Okay, so let's define the dyadic UMD property. Just so that you know what we're actually talking about. Uh, we have an exponent P like we usually do. A Barnack space X has the Actually, before I define the dyadic UMD property, let me just remind you exactly what the UMD property is. And then we can modify the definition because people probably forgot. Barnack space X has the UMD P property. Remember, we initially introduced UMD with an exponent P that turned out not to be important. X has the UMD P property. If there exists a finite constant such that for all X valued LP bounded martingales, F on some probability space with respect to some filtration. So let's just say on some omega, that's our probability space. And for all sequences of signs psi, so let's just call this a sign sequence sequence of plus minus ones, we have this unconditionality estimate here. Xi n, df n, so that's the, the different sequence of the martingale. Uh, now when we take the LP norm of that, this needs to be bounded by let's say f sub n. There are lots of equivalent ways to write this, you would have seen that by now. And this is for all natural numbers n. I don't know if this is exactly the way that we wrote it in the first place, but this is equivalent certainly to what we wrote. So this is the UMDP property as we introduced it before, at least equivalent to how we introduced it before. And the dyadic UMD property. So let's say X has the, the dyadic UMDP property. It's the same property, but we don't consider all Martin curls. So we only consider martingales F with respect to the dyadic filtration. On the unit interval. Otherwise, the property is exactly the same. So now this omega becomes the unit interval on the left and right hand side. Remember the dyadic filtration on the unit interval, it looks like this. If this is the unit interval, then you have all of the dyadic intervals contained within that. Standard dyadic intervals, none of these translated shifted things that we were dealing with the other week. And so on, this is your dyadic filtration. 
in a picture. So dyadic UMD is just unconditionality of dyadic martingales, martingales with respect to the dyadic filtration. And of course, UMDP implies dyadic UMDP because you're just asking for less with the dyadic property. Okay, and the theorem we're gonna prove is that for all P between one and infinity, UMDP is equivalent to dyadic UMDP. One direction is obvious, the other direction is not trivial. Another way of saying this is just if you have unconditionality of all dyadic martingales, all dyadic martingale different sequences, then you have unconditionality of all martingale different sequences, and it suffices to check the dyadic ones. Makes things a lot easier when you're proving the UMDP property. And that'll take the whole lecture to prove this. It's a reduction by a bunch of lemmas. Some of them are technical and not that interesting. Some of them are technical and a little bit more interesting. I won't give every single detail because it'll take too long, but I'll give all the details are in the notes, certainly. The notes are full of typos, but you can fix that. I'm gonna fix that today, I think. Let's start with our first lemma. Before the lemmas, I mean, just what are we doing here? We're gonna take some sort of arbitrary martingale and reduce it down repeatedly until we just get these dyadic martingales somehow. So we need to think quite hard about filtrations, it turns out. Martingales are pretty much determined by filtrations. We need to think about arbitrary filtrations and how we can relate them to the dyadic one. That's the key. So let's start the math. Let's take a Barnack space. Exponent P, it's allowed to be one for most of these lemmas, but for the UMD property, it's greater than one. We have a probability space. Probability space. And an LP bounded martingale. Valued in X. I'll write M girl, it's quicker. It's with respect to some filtration, but I haven't said which, it doesn't really matter. So what this lemma says is that you can approximate martingales by what are called simple martingales. You can approximate functions by simple functions. You can approximate martingales by simple martingales. So what does that mean? For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an X valued martingale G on the same probability space. It's on a different filtration, but I'm not really mentioning the filtrations. And it has the following properties. The most important one is that each GN is a simple function. So it has a finite range. It's basically, you know, a bunch of step functions. So each of the GNs are simple functions. Uh, the difference sequence of F is close to the difference sequence of G. So the differences are less than well, there's different things you can write here. We're going to write two to the minus n minus one epsilon. So that as n goes to infinity, the differences get closer and closer to each other. And fn minus gn, so the actual values of the martingale itself, rather than the different sequences, this is less than or equal to epsilon. These properties are for all n. Right. So this is saying exactly that every martingale can be approximated by a martingale made of simple functions quite well. Let's prove that. So let's start by taking the filtration generated by F. So we start with a martingale. It's a martingale with respect to some filtration, but that means in particular, it's a martingale with respect to the filtration that it generates. That's basically the, the minimal filtration for which this F is a martingale. Uh, and for all N, let's start by taking, well, we know that there exists a function which we'll call Fn prime. It's in LP, it's measurable with respect to F sub N. Uh, there exists 
an Fn prime such that dfn minus, I should say it's simple. I forgot to write it in my notes, it's simple. There exists a simple function fn prime such that dfn is well approximated by fn prime. It's approximated, let's say it's, this distance is less than two to the minus n minus two epsilon. Simple functions are dense in the Bochner space as LP. So we can approximate dfn by a simple function arbitrarily well. Let's take such a thing. And what do we want to do after that? Let's then take F prime to be the filtration generated by the Fn primes. We know that this filtration will actually be contained in the filtration F because why is this? Every Fn prime is Fn measurable. So the sigma algebra Fn, so I should say this, I should write this down. Fn prime is contained in Fn just by construction. Uh, what else do we want to do from here? So we've got these functions Fn prime that are approximating the different sequence of F pretty well. The problem is that's not going to be a Martin girl. Like just taking arbitrary functions, you're not going to get a Martin girl out of that. So we need to convert the Fn primes to a Martin girl somehow. We do that by basically forcing the Martin girl property. We define a different sequence, dgn. You can define a sequence of functions by its different sequence. Define dgn to be either Fn prime minus the conditional expectation on F prime n minus one of Fn prime. We do that if n is greater than or equal to one. If n equals zero, we just take dg zero to be f zero prime. So defining it in this way, you see that the conditional expectation with respect to fn minus one prime of dgn is gonna be zero. We just force this to hold. We've done this before in different arguments. So just to write that out, This is true for all n greater than or equal to one. So this sequence of functions G that comes out of that different sequence, that's a martingale. It's a martingale with respect to the sigma, uh, with respect to the filtration F prime. And each DGN is simple because Fn prime is simple and the sigma algebra Fn minus one prime is finite. So when you take a simple function or indeed any function, and then you take a conditional expectation with respect to a finite sigma algebra, you'll get a simple function. Uh, there are only finitely many sets in the sigma algebra. So you're gonna have one constant value in each of those sets, which means that the function has constant range, uh, sorry, constant finite range. So these functions dgn that you build are simple and it follows that Gn is also simple because Gn is just a, a finite sum of simple functions. Gn is a sum of its different sequence. So we've constructed now a Martin girl G, which is made of simple functions. And we just need to show now that it's close to F. Right. So let's just, before showing that, one little technical thing that's going to help us. If we take DFN, so this F original Martingale F here, and we take the conditional expectation with respect to F prime N minus one. If I didn't have this prime, this would be zero because F is a Martingale. But now we have the F prime here. This is the conditional expectation with respect to F prime and with respect to F. Sorry, let me just write that out. This is because F prime N minus one is contained in F N minus one, as I wrote above. So we have this monotonicity property of conditional expectations. And this one here is zero, right? So this conditional expectation is still zero. This is gonna help us in the computation uh, where we show that G is close to F. So for all N greater than or equal to one, we can also do n equals zero separately. We just have these because of how we defined 
DGN, we had two cases in greater than or equal to one and n equals zero, purely because I have this n minus one here that wouldn't make sense if n was zero. Let's show that the different sequences of F and G are close to each other. First, we just write out the definition of what DGN is. Remember we defined DGN up here. So the Fn minus Fn prime plus the conditional expectation with respect to Fn minus one prime of Fn prime. And because of this computation above, this one just here, because this, this conditional expectation here is zero, I can add it. <laughs> I can add zero to anything and not change it. So I can say this is the Fn minus Fn prime plus this conditional expectation that was here. So I want a plus or a minus. I want a minus. Minus the conditional expectation of D Fn. Just to reiterate, this is equal to zero. So of course we can subtract it for free. Then we use a triangle inequality. We have the LP norm of DFN minus FN prime, which we know is small because that's how we chose FN prime, such that this thing is less than not just epsilon, but two to the, what is it, minus N minus one epsilon. And then we have a term with the conditional expectation of Fn prime minus Dfn. And we also know that that's small by the same argument, right? So this is less than, sorry, this term here is less than two to the minus N minus one epsilon by construction. This term here is also less than two to the minus N minus one epsilon because the conditional expectation only makes the thing smaller. So we can ignore the conditional expectation. We have the same term as before. So this whole thing is less than two to the minus N. Sorry, this should be two, not one. Then we get two to the minus N minus one epsilon because there are two of those terms. And this is the, the first thing that we wanted to show. At least for N greater than or equal to one, everything still works for N equals zero, just slightly different notation. In fact, there's even less to prove. This is fine. That was the first thing we wanted to show. The other thing we need for all n is that fn minus gn is small, but this just follows from the fact that fn and gn are both sums of their different sequences and the different sequences are very close together. So this is less than or equal to the sum over m up to capital N, uh, no capital N, small n, capital N comes later. So just telescoping, writing it out as the sum of the differences. This is less than or equal to the sum of two to the minus M minus two epsilon. And that when you do the sum is less than epsilon. Good. Yeah, that's true. Okay. All of these two to the minus M whatever's, they're not really that important. It's just to make everything sum nicely. You can take different constants there, doesn't really matter. But this will work for us. So that shows every martingale can be approximated very well by a martingale consisting of simple functions. And this is gonna help us reduce down to the dyadic situation eventually, but not yet. Any questions about the proof or the lemma? All good, all right. So now let's have a think. If we consider a stochastic process or a martingale, it's a process of simple functions, like the kind of martingale that we reduced to above, uh, it's on a probability space, and consider the filtration generated by these functions. then because each of these functions f sub n is a simple function and therefore it's got finite range every one of these sigma algebras is finite so it's finite 
and atomic. So finite means there are finitely many sets in the sigma algebra, of course. And atomic means that if you have, uh, I think I've said what atomic means before, right? If you have probability of A, uh, so if you have A in Fn and A equals B union C, where B and C are both in Fn, then probability of B is zero or probability of C is zero. So if you can decompose a set in the sigma algebra into smaller sets, necessarily one of those smaller sets has to have probability zero. And that's what atomic means. You can't decompose things arbitrarily small without just hitting zero <laughs> in a sense. Uh, what else do I want to say about this? I've lost myself in my notes here. Right. So we've got, if we take an arbitrary martingale and we approximate it by a martingale of simple functions, then the filtration associated to that new martingale consists of finite atomic sigma algebras. And that's important. So given such a sigma algebra, or such a filtration, here's an important step. There exists, um, hmm, hang on. I want to make the filtration actually finite. Given a filtration Fn, where you only have finitely many terms. So finite filtrations of finite sigma algebras. Given such a finite filtration, there exists another filtration. We'll call it F prime, but this filtration is on the unit interval. This is the key thing we're doing here, changing the probability space. I started with a filtration on an arbitrary probability space and I'm gonna construct a new one on the unit interval. So I start with an arbitrary probability space. I end up on the unit interval. There exists such a, fil a filtration such that each Fn prime is finite and atomic. Uh, all of the atoms of Fn prime, so these smallest sets, although it's finite, so there's no real smallest. Well, yeah, all of the atoms of Fn prime are intervals not just arbitrary subsets of the unit interval, but actual subintervals. And every atom A in Fn corresponds to an atom I sub A of Fn prime. Um, I should say that there's, there's a bijective correspondence. Let me make that a bit more precise. That's a little bit too imprecise. There's a bijective correspondence between the atoms A of Fn and the atoms, which we can call I sub A of Fn prime, such that the probability of the atom A is the same thing as the length of the corresponding interval. All I'm saying here is that if you draw this picture of a, a finite filtration of finite sigma algebras where you imagine it looks sort of like this, maybe this is F0, this is F1 and so on. You implicitly think of this as being like intervals and subintervals, just psychologically, that's the easiest model to take. This is kind of universal. If you ever have a finite filtration of finite sigma algebras, you can realize that with intervals and preserve all of the probabilities and all of the containment relations and so on. Uh, yeah, what do I want to say about that? I should also, this bijective correspondence, if A is contained in B, then you have the same containment relation for the corresponding intervals. So the whole set containment structure of the atoms of this filtration is basically isomorphic to a set containment structure of a filtration of intervals on the unit interval. I haven't given a very good explanation of that, but it's kind of intuitive. Uh, this correspondence, uh, it gives you an isomorphism, which is actually an isometry. So it gives an isometric isomorphism 
between the corresponding LP spaces. So if you have two filtrations and they're basically the same filtration, but just viewed on different probability spaces, then you get an isomorphism between the corresponding LP spaces. Valued in any Barnack space, doesn't matter which. Uh, F prime N valued in X for all P including one and including infinity. And because the filtration structures are pretty much the same, this also says that the conditional expectations with respect to one of these views is gonna be the same thing as a conditional expectation with respect to the other. So what that means in terms of this isomorphism is for all functions G, uh, on the first probability space and for all N, from zero up to n, the isomorphism applied to the conditional expectation of G with respect to F sub n is the same thing as doing the isomorphism first and then applying the corresponding conditional expectation in the other filtration. This is all a very convoluted way of saying that when you take a finite filtration of finite sigma algebras, you may as well assume you're on the unit interval. It makes no difference. Now this kind of filtration, I should have given it a name, a filtration on the unit interval such that every sigma algebra is finite and atomic, all of the atoms are intervals. We're going to call this a finite interval filtration. A, filtra a finite filtration consisting only of intervals essentially. We'll abbreviate that to an FIF because it's gonna come up repeatedly. So what we've shown up to this point, an important proposition, to show that a Barnack space X has the UMDP property, it suffices to check Martingale's F on the unit interval with respect to finite interval filtrations. So basically we've already reduced to, from all martingales to martingales on the unit interval on finite interval filtrations. Not necessarily dyadic ones, but ones consisting of intervals. And this needs some proof, we're not actually there yet. All we've really shown so far is that every martingale can be approximated by martingales of simple functions. But we've also sort of shown that when this filtration associated to such a martingale corresponds to a finite interval filtration when you truncate it down to a certain level. Let's do those details. Fix P and fix F, which is an LP bounded X valued martingale on some probability space. Uh, let epsilon be greater than zero. Then there exists an X valued martingale G on the same probability space of simple functions. That was our first lemma. We can approximate the martingale F by a simple martingale. So then when we want to estimate this, this martingale transform of F with a sequence of signs, as you do when you're checking the UMD property, first thing you do is you approximate F by G, just using the triangle inequality. So let's take the P norm of that, plus an error term, Xi N, dfn minus dgn. <clears throat> and this error term here, you already know that this is less than or equal to the sum over n of the LP norm of dfn minus dgn, just completely ignoring the signs using the triangle inequality naively. Each of these is less than two to the minus n minus one epsilon. Uh, 
So this whole sum is less than epsilon, at least the error term. And for this first term where you have GN instead of FN, now GN is a martingale of simple functions. You can write that as Xi N, write the, the different sequences, the difference of conditional expectations of G capital N. And just recall, this is all happening on the probability space omega, which was arbitrary. And now we used this isomorphism Psi from before this one up here that comes from the fact that this filtration F0 up to Fn, which consists of uh, finite atomic sigma algebras corresponds to a finite integral filtration. So where am I in my notes? I'm here. We can apply this isomorphism everywhere. So Gn becomes Psi inverse Gn and then these conditional expectations become with respect to a different filtration. And now we're working on the unit interval. This F prime dot is a finite interval filtration. And then we can use, if we assume the UMD property on finite interval filtrations, UMDP on finite interval filtrations, this will be less than a constant times Psi inverse of Gn. And that will just be the norm of Gn. <coughs> so yeah, based on this approximation theorem we've got by simple Martin Gels, we see actually, if we want to prove the UMD property, you only need to check the unit interval and you only need to check finite interval filtrations. So that already makes things a lot simpler, but it's not, the dyadic filtration yet. We can still have intervals in arbitrary places of arbitrary lengths. We need to reduce that down to the, this one dyadic one. That was a little bit quick. Does anyone have any questions about this? Everyone's okay with what finite interval filtrations are? They're the simplest filtrations really. So they're kind of easy. Maybe you were thinking of them all along when you were thinking of filtrations without even realizing it. Or would we never think of that? We think only of dyadic uh, interval filtrations, right? Perhaps, yeah, or translated one. I didn't oh, realize okay. you were there yet. My, my Zoom myself, didn't say sorry. you showed up. Yeah. Okay, I'll but, see what's happened here. My Zoom is not showing me, everybody yeah. that's on. I didn't make my window full screen. Okay, cool. So you were there the whole time. Very good. Yeah. All right. Uh, yep. I've lost my place somehow. Right, so we can consider finite interval filtrations all the time. That makes our life a bit easier. And yep, let's consider one of them. Consider a finite interval filtration, Fn, n from zero to capital N. And just for simplicity, let's take the zeroth element to be trivial. So the trivial sigma algebra contains the empty set, the full set. Uh, without loss of generality, We'll always assume this. Doesn't hurt us to assume that. So if we think about the combinatorial structure of one of these filtrations, basically this filtration F corresponds to a tree, more precisely a rooted tree using graph theoretic terminology with N levels. Uh, if you're not familiar with what a tree is, I mean, you will be in a second. I'll draw an example and then it will all make perfect sense. If this is your finite interval filtration, so it starts out like this, maybe there's some subsets here. Maybe you've only got four levels. Then you can draw a tree. So the root corresponds to the, the full space. Then you have two more vertices corresponding to the sets at the next level. And then they have connections based on the subset relations. This one's got two subsets, sub atoms. This one's only got the one. Right. So this is our finite interval filtration and this is the tree corresponding to it. 
So f corresponds to a rooted tree, t sub f. Uh, in graph theory, you write the a graph as the the pair of vert the sorry a pair consisting of the set of vertices and the set of edges. Although we're never going to use the set of edges explicitly. And what else do we need? There is a function. which I'll call alpha, mapping the vertices of the tree into the filtration, well, into the sigma algebra F sub capital N. So the largest, filtra largest sigma algebra of the filtration, sending vertices of the tree to atoms of the filtration. So in this example here, if this is the vertex V, this set here will be alpha V, this atom of F1, or if I take this vertex here, W, would correspond to this atom here of F sub four. This is all very geometric and visual and it, seeing one picture of this is a lot more illustrative than me giving a definition. Every finite interval filtration has this structure for some tree. It and seems to say, me that typically from your previous construction, you would get trees where every vertex has lots of edges going down, right? Yeah. Because you yeah. sort of here as there's many, only ever finitely many. As many edges, finitely many, but as many edges as the, the difference function has values, something like yeah. this, right? Yeah. I mean, you can do this construction for any filtration on any space. It doesn't have yeah, to yeah, be a finite right. interval one, but I'm just going to restrict attention to them just to keep it simple. Pun not intended. Everything is simple here. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah. If we have two finite interval filtrations, f and f prime, we say that they're commonly indexed uh, if the underlying trees, t sub f and t sub f prime, are isomorphic as graphs. Basically, that means they have the same tree associated to them. And what the reason I call that commonly indexed, or at least the reason that Pizier calls that commonly indexed, is that means that you can have a common indexation of the atoms of both of the filtrations. So I could draw another filtration here that's got the same tree, but which isn't the same filtration, just make all of the sizes a bit different. Split that in two. So here's a different filtration but it's got the same underlying tree. Oh, okay, I'll say the same to mean that the graphs are isomorphic. They're not necessarily equal as sets, but the graph structure is exactly the same. Again, this is sort of visually intuitive more than, you know, if I make a formal definition. And we need this terminology because we need to be able to talk about filtrations that have atoms indexed in exactly the same way, but that are not necessarily the same filtrations. The sets might be different, but the, the combinatorics underlying it are exactly the same. The probabilities can be different. The lengths can all be different. So the geometry can change, but the, the combinatorial structure is the same. I should have called that a definition, but I didn't. Let's call this a definition now. If we consider two finite interval filtrations, which are commonly indexed, Uh, with the associated tree T. So they have the same tree underlying the two structures. And let's let alpha map the vertices of the tree to F sub N and alpha prime map the vertices of the tree to F sub N prime. So we'll let these be the vertex to atom maps. I should have given that a name. Vertex to atom map. So let these alpha and alpha prime be the corresponding vertex to atom maps. Uh, if we're given an epsilon between zero and one, you can take epsilon greater than one, but it's meaningless. We'll say that these two filtrations are epsilon close. That's what we're defining. If for all vertices of the tree, so for all atoms in, for all in indices of the atoms, 
all vertices in the tree, the symmetric difference between the atom of F and the corresponding atom of F prime has to be less than epsilon. Does everybody know what a symmetric difference is? Better write it down just to be sure. A delta B is, uh, what is it? The, the union, take away the intersection. It's called the symmetric difference. I think pretty much everybody learns that terminology, but sometimes people don't know it, so I'd better make it clear. Basically, two of these finite interval filtrations are epsilon close if their atoms are indexed in exactly the same way and if the atoms are very close to each other. That's what this symmetric difference condition says. So if I just very quickly draw an example, if this is a unit interval, and if the first level of one of our filtrations looks like that, and the first level of the other filtration looks like this, and if epsilon is appropriate, you could say these filtrations are pretty close, right? These intervals are very close to each other. You want that at every level for epsilon closeness. Very small example there. And just one immediate consequence of epsilon, uh, epsilon closeness, if you've got this symmetric difference condition here, that will imply that the length of one of the, of the two atoms are very close. It implies that, it's not equivalent to that. I don't think oh, it's pretty close to being that. Actually, yeah, it, it's not implied by that. If the two atoms, the two corresponding atoms are very close to each other, then their lengths also have to be very close to each other. The converse is not true. They could be in completely different places and have the same length. All right. Okay. I think it's time for the break. Um, there's a question in the chat I just saw. Commonly indexed means that trees are isomorphic as rooted graphs, not just graphs. Yeah, I should say as rooted graphs. Is it true if you just say graphs? Probably not. I haven't really thought about well, that. Well, if they're finite, graphs, then, yeah. then you should be just by counting the length of the branches. This cover and the count, what I mean, we cover the root maybe. I'll have a think about that in the break. Oh, yeah, okay. But I'll just say rooted graphs to be sure. Yeah, rooted graphs is a safe thing to say. Yep. Uh, we don't know, so that's more if it gets rooted graphs. This concept isn't so important outside this lecture anyway. This is all local definitions that I'm never going to use again after today. <laughs> this is all just for these proofs. Yeah. Okay, let's have our break. Uh, are there other questions? Um, yeah. Was that a question? Uh, I, I, no, okay. So maybe it's, it's only that maybe uh, you just said something like, uh, okay, so like the tree that you produce are kind of always they. Every every interval has two sons or, or two children or or. or, or uh, no, that's just how I've been drawing them. They don't necessarily. Sometimes they have none. I mean, just the one. Sometimes they've got ten. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I guess the the ten you can kind of reproduce in different level as just uh, two, 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 two sons. So. We're gonna do that later on, actually, in one of the lemmas after. So all of these filtrations as trees. I mean, you start with a root. Maybe you've got a bunch of. Yeah. yeah children of that maybe one of them's only got one maybe one of these has got five maybe this has got two you know and you can have a lot of combinatorial structure there but eventually we're going to reduce everything down to the dyadic filtration yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah. is a simple binary tree yes like that yeah and we have to do that by embedding the sets maybe into higher levels or unions of things in higher levels it'll be clear in the next hour Okay. Well, I don't know if that answers the question. Yes, I will wait then. Okay. And you can ask again after the next hour. <laughs>